Hello everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our chapter book story time here at the Caribou Public Library. I'm Miss Erin and we're continuing to read Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. We are reading the second half of chapter 28 today. If you'll remember last time, Meg and John are newly married and they had an issue, right? They had their first kind of quarrel because she was having a very frustrating time trying to make jelly and he brought home a dinner visitor without letting her know. And there was some misunderstandings and then they figured out how to forgive and move on. So after this, Meg had Mr. Scott to dinner by special invitation and served him up a pleasant feast without a cooked wife for the first course. On which occasion she was so gay and gracious and made everything go off so charmingly that Mr. Scott told John he was a happy fellow and shook his head over the hardships of bachelorhood all the way home. In the autumn, new trials and experiences came to Meg. Sally Moffat renewed her friendship, was always running out for a dish of gossip at the little house, or inviting that poor dear to come in and spend the day at the big house. It was pleasant, for in dull winter weather, Meg often felt lonely. All were busy at home, John absent till night, and nothing to do but sew or read or pot put her about. So it naturally fell out that Meg got into the way of gadding and gossiping with her friend. Seeing Sally's pretty things made her long for such, and pity herself because she had not got them. Sally was very kind, and often offered her the coveted trifles, but Meg declined them, knowing that John wouldn't like it. And then this foolish little woman went and did what John disliked infinitely worse. She knew her husband's income, and she loved to feel that he trusted her, not only with his happiness, but what some men seemed to value more, his money. She knew where it was, was free to take what she liked, and all he asked was that she should keep account of every penny, pay bills once a month, and remember that she was a poor man's wife. Till now she had done well, been prudent and exact, kept her little account books neatly, and showed them to him monthly without fear. But that autumn, the serpent got into Meg's paradise and tempted her, like many a modern Eve, not with apples, but with dress. Meg didn't like to be pitied and made to feel poor. It irritated her, but she was ashamed to confess it. Now and then she tried to console herself by buying something pretty so that Sally needn't think she had to scrimp. She always felt wicked after it, for the pretty things were seldom nece necessaries. But then they cost so little it wasn't worth worrying about. So the trifles increased unconsciously, and in the shopping excursions, she was no longer a passive looker-on. But the trifles cost more than one would imagine, and when she cast up her accounts at the end of the month, the sum total rather scared her. John was busy that month and left the bills to her. The next month he was absent, but the third, he had a grand quarterly settling up, and Meg never forgot it. A few days before, she had done a dreadful thing, and it weighed upon her conscience. Sally had been buying silks, and Meg ached for a new one, just a handsome light one for parties. Her black silk was so common, and thin things for evening wear were only proper for girls. Aunt March usually gave the sisters a present of $25 apiece. At New Year's, that was only a month to wait, and here was a lovely violet silk going at a bargain, and she had the money, if only she dared to take it. John always said what was his was hers, but he would think it right to spend not o would he think it right to spend not only the prospective five and twenty, but another five and twenty out of the whole household fund? That was the question. Sally had urged her to do it, had offered to loan the money, and with the best intentions in life had tempted Meg beyond her strength. In an evil moment, the shopman held up the lovely shimmering folds and said, A bargain, I assure you, ma'am. She answered, I'll take it. And it was cut off and paid for, and Sally had exulted, and she had laughed as if it was a thing of no consequence, and driven away feeling as if she had stolen something, and the police were after her. When she got home, she tried to assuage the pangs of remorse by spreading forth the lovely silk. But it looked less silvery now, didn't become her, after all, and the words fifty dollars seemed stamped like a pattern down each breadth. She put it away, but it haunted her, not delightfully as a new dress should, but dreadfully like the ghost of a folly that was not easily laid. 
When John got out his books that night, Meg's heart sank. And for the first time in her married life, she was afraid for her husband, afraid of her husband. The kind brown eyes looked as if they could be stern. And though he was unusually merry, she fancied he had found her out, but didn't mean to let her know it. The house bills were all paid, the books all in order. John had praised her and was undoing the old pocketbook, which they called the bank, when Meg, knowing that it was quite empty, stopped his hand, saying nervously, You haven't seen my private expense book yet. John never asked to see it, but she always insisted on his doing so and used to enjoy his masculine amazement on the queer things women wanted and made him guess what piping was demand fiercely the meaning of a hug-me-tight, or wonder what a little thing composed of three rosebuds, a bit of velvet, and a pair of strings could possibly be a bonnet, and cost five or six dollars. That night, he looked as if he would like the fun of quizzing her figures, and pretending to be horrified at her extravagance, as he often did, being particularly proud of his prudent wife. The little book was brought slowly out and laid down before him. Meg got behind his chair under pretense of smoothing the wrinkles out of his tired forehead. And standing there, she said, with her panic increasing with every word, John, dear, I'm ashamed to show you my book, for I've really been dreadfully extravagant lately. I go about so much, I must have things, you know, and Sally advised my getting it. So I did, and my New Year's money will partly pay for it, but I was sorry after I'd done it, for I knew you'd think it wrong of me. John laughed and drew her round beside him, saying good-humouredly, Don't go and hide. I won't beat you if you have got a pair of killing boots. I'm rather proud of my wife's feet, and don't mind if she does pay eight or nine dollars for her boots, if they are good ones. That had been one of her last trifles, and John's eyes had fallen on it as he spoke. Oh, what will he say when he comes to that awful fifty dollars, thought Meg with a shiver. It's worse than boots. It's a silk dress, she said, with the calmness of desperation, for she wanted the worst over. Well, dear, what is the demmed total, as Mr. Malatini says? That didn't sound like John, and she knew he was looking up at her with the straightforward look that she had always been ready to meet and answer with one as frank, until now. She turned the page and her head at the same time, pointing to the sum which would have been paid enough which would, would, would have been bad enough without the 50, but which was appalling to her with that added. For a minute, the room was very still, and John said slowly, but she could feel it cost him an effort to express no displeasure. Well, I don't know that 50 is much for a dress, and with all the fur, fur below's and quinny dingles, you'll have to finish it off these days. It isn't made or trimmed, sighed Meg faintly, for a sudden recollection of the cost still to be incurred quite overwhelmed her because they had to, she was going to make the dress, right? It was just the fabric. 25 yards of silk seems a good deal to cover one small woman, but I've no doubt my wife will look as fine as Ned Moffat's when she gets it on, said John dryly. I know you're angry, John, but I can't help it. I don't mean to waste your money. I didn't think of those little things would count up so, and I can't resist them when I see Sally buying all she wants and pitying me because I don't. I try to be contented, but it is hard, and I'm tired of being poor. These last words were spoken so low that she thought he did not hear them, but he did, and they wounded him deeply, for he had denied himself many pleasures for Meg's sake. She could have bitten her tongue out the minute she had said it, for John pushed the books away and got up, saying, with a little quiver in his voice, I was afraid of this. I do my best, Meg. If he had scolded her or even shaken her, it would not have broken her heart like those few words. She ran to him and held him close, crying with repentant tears. Oh, John, my dear, kind, hard-working boy, I didn't mean it. I was so wicked, so untrue and ungrateful. How could I say it? Oh, how could I say it? He was very kind, forgave her readily, and did not utter one reproach. But Meg knew that she had done and said a thing which would not be forgotten soon, although he might never allude to it again. She had promised to love him for better or for worse, and then she, his wife, had reproached him with his poverty after spending his earnings recklessly. 
It was dreadful. And the worst of it was John went on so quietly afterward, just as if nothing had happened, except that he stayed in town later and worked at night when she had gone to cry herself to sleep. A week of remorse nearly made Meg sick, and the discovery that John had countermanded the order for his great, his new great coat reduced her to a state of despair, which was pathetic to behold. He had simply said, in answer to her surprised inquiries as to the change, I can't afford it, my dear. Meg said no more, but a few minutes after he found her in the hall with her face buried in the, great, in the old great coat, crying as if her heart would break. They had a long talk that night, and Meg learned to love her husband better for his poverty, because it seemed to have made a man of him, giving him the strength and courage to fight his own way, and taught him a tender patience with which to bear and comfort the natural longings and failures of those he loved. Next day, she put her pride in her pocket, went to Sally, told the truth, and asked her to buy the silk as a favor. The good-natured Mrs. Moffat willingly did so, and had the delicacy not to make her a present of it immediately afterward. Then Meg ordered home the great coat, and when John arrived, she put it on and asked him how he liked her new silk gown. One can imagine what answer he made, how he received his present, and what a blissful state of things ensued. John came home early, Meg gadded no more, and that great coat was put on in the morning by a very happy husband, and taken off at night by a most devoted little wife. So the year rolled round, and at midsummer, there came to Meg a new experience, the deepest and tenderest of a woman's life. Laurie came sneaking into the kitchen of a dove dovecoat one Saturday, and with an excited face, and was received with the clash of cymbals, for Hannah clapped her hands with a saucepan in one and the cover in the other. How's the little ma? Where is everybody? Why didn't you tell me before I came home? began Laurie in a loud whisper. Happy as a queen, the dear, every soul of em is upstairs a worshipin'. We didn't want no hurricanes round. Now you go into the parlor and I'll send em down to you. With which somewhat involved happy reply, Hannah vanished, chuckling ecstatically. Presently, Joe appeared, proudly bearing a small flannel bundle laid forth upon a large pillow. Joe's face was very sober, but her eyes twinkled, and there was an odd sound in her voice of repressed emotion of some sort. Shut your eyes and hold out your arms, she said invitingly. Laurie backed precipitately into a corner, put his hands behind him with an employing gesture. No, thank you, I'd rather not. I shall drop it or smash it as sure as fate. Then you shan't see your new nephew, said Joe decidedly, turning as if to go. I will, I will, only you must be responsible for damages. And obeying orders, Laurie heroically shut his eyes while something was put into his arms. A peal of laughter from Joe, Amy, Mrs. March, Hannah, and John caused him to open them the next minute to find himself invested with two babies instead of one. No wonder they laughed, for the expression of his face was droll enough to convulse a Quaker as he stood and stared wildly from the unconscious innocence to the hilarious spectators, with such dismay that Joe sat down on the floor and screamed. <laughs> Twins by Jupiter, was all he said for a minute, then turning to the women with an appealing look that was comically piteous, he added, take em quick, somebody, I'm going to laugh and I shall drop em. John rescued his babies and marched up and down with one on each arm, as if already initiated into the mysteries of baby tending, while Laurie laughed until the tears ran down his cheeks. It's the best joke of the season, isn't it? I wouldn't have told you, for I set my heart on surprising you, and I flatter myself I've done it, said Joe when she got her breath. I never was more staggered in my life. Isn't it fun? Are they boys? What are you going to name them? Let's have another look. Hold me up, Joe, for upon my life it's one too many for me, returned Laurie, regarding the infants with the air of a big benevolent Newfoundland looking at a pair of infantile kittens. <laughs> Boy and girl, aren't they beauties, said the proud papa, beaming down upon the little red squirmers as if they were unfledged, unfledged angels. Most remarkable children I ever saw. Which is which, said Laurie, bent like a well sweep to examine the prodigy prodigies. Amy put a blue ribbon on the boy and a pink on the girl. French fashion, so you can always tell. Besides, one has blue eyes and one brown. Kiss him, Uncle Teddy, said the wicked Joe. 
I'm afraid they mightn't like it, began Laurie, with unusual timidity in such manners. Of course they will. They are used to it now. Do it this minute, sir, commanded Joe, fearing that he might propose a proxy. Laurie screwed up his face and obeyed with a gingerly peck on each little cheek that produced another laugh and made the baby squeal. There, I knew they didn't like it. That's the boy. See him kick? He hits out with his fists like a good one. Now then, young Brooke, pitch into a man of your own size, will you? cried Laurie, delighted with a poke in the face from a tiny fist flapping aimlessly about. He's to be named John Lawrence and the girl, Margaret, after mother and grandmother. We shall call her Daisy, so as not to have two Megs, and I suppose the Manny will be Jack, unless we find a better name, said Amy, with aunt-like interest. Name him Demijohn, and call him Demi for short, said Laurie. Daisy and Demi, just the thing. I knew Teddy would do it, cried Joe, clapping her hands. Teddy certainly had done it that time, for the babies were Daisy and Demi to the end of the chapter. And that is the end of our chapter. We'll carry on to chapter 29 next time. Bye for now.